Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSound. Red team testing is somewhat intrusive by nature as it involves breaking into companies, albeit at their request, to help them improve their security. Red teamers must bluff their way past receptionists and hack into employee computers, things that would put anyone else in a lot of trouble. So at what point do red teaming activities cross the line into being unethical or even criminal? What is a red teamer not willing to do in the name of security? And how can red teamers and companies alike make sure that their own ethical concerns are addressed? Here today to hash this through is F-Secure's veteran red teamer Tom van de Wiele. Welcome, Tom. Thanks. So let's start at the beginning when a client orders a service. Do you ever get asked to do a red teaming test that's not strictly towards the company, like on a third party almost? That happens sometimes. And sometimes the customer knows. Uh, and sometimes they honestly don't know where they think, for example, they they own the building or they have a certain responsibility over the service. But it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you can just go and, and, and test that for, for security holes or try to intrude it. So how do you know that? Like, how do you know who owns the building? There was a fairly public case in the U.S. recently where some red teamers got into some hot water because they were performing an assignment as ordered, but then somebody decided that they didn't like this after all. That uh, was a very uh, interesting case, and it dealt with uh, federal law versus uh, local laws. Finding that out is part of our homework, and we try to do our, our due diligence there to make sure that we are not breaking the law Uh, and that uh, ultimately our our customer doesn't get into trouble either. Okay. Any other kinds of uh, sort of ethical concerns you have right there in that first customer meeting? Well, usually if you have done this for a while, you can kind of read between the lines as far as what the customer wants to have tested and why. You would always get the boilerplate explanation of we want to do this for security reasons, but there's always usually... Uh, another reason to do this. Um, So you try to ask questions as far as what defense mechanisms does the customer want to have tested. But sometimes, you know, discussions come out where they say, look, we we really hate this particular supplier. And the only way that we can kick them out is by giving a really bad review. So if you guys could just, you know, do your tests, but whatever you come across from, you know, you know, vendor ABC, make sure it looks really bad, for example. And there we have to push back and say, look, we need to treat all vendors uh, in this in the same way. We cannot, you know, write the report, you know, there in the, in in the pre-sales meeting even before you've started. Um, but these are examples of uh, of things that that uh, do come about. Do you often get sort of asked to sort of put the customers what the customer already knows to be the case to sort of to put that in your own words so that it carries more weight because it comes from outside the organization sometimes that gets asked of course sometimes we we come to our own conclusions and then it turns out that the customer was right but sometimes the picking of the words can be very specific and whatever you write can be used as a as a stone to throw at uh, at someone or a company or or what have you so we try to be very detailed in how we put certain things in the reports uh, and try to uh, add as much context as possible so it doesn't become a, a black and white statement that can be used uh, for whatever purposes of uh, someone that's that's you know has it in their hand and wants to use it against someone else. Right. But then again, often like things like red teaming assignments are ordered so almost to to also show internal stakeholders what the reality of the situation is. Do you have an ethical problem with that? Um well, it depends really, and you're going to hear that, hear that sentence a lot, of course, because all situations are different, and there's always context to 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 consider. Ethics, um, especially. Ethics, especially. Um, also, because when you really look at uh, the whole uh, definition of it, the whole ethical part comes in where where something is technically not illegal, but could still have consequences for for yourself, for others, the customer, or or even both. So it's kind of a common courtesy towards the people you work with or you work for to determine wh- where these these ethics begin and, and where they stop and where you hit a certain gray zone where you need to you know discuss certain topics with your customer as far as what you will do, what you will not do, uh, and wh- how you will react or what decisions you will make given a certain set of parameters or certain situations. 
So in information security, especially in red teaming, there are, of course, do's and don'ts in the industry, as is with every, uh, every profession. And those get ultimately translated into best practices. But you're not going to be able to find a textbook that is able to outline you every single consideration you need to make when, for example, dealing with customers that require red teaming or where you have to do a certain job or try to get into a certain service or try to get uh, or read someone's uh, information uh, or work data. So cybersecurity professionals need to be aware of the many ways in which their actions or their you know inaction might have a significant impact on someone else's life, someone else's work, the company uh, as a whole, and either now or, or in the future. Can you give us like examples of where, where do you draw the line? Like what kind of assignments have you actually turned down? Um, we've turned down assignments where the customer asked us to get into services or facilities that they didn't own. Yeah. So think cloud services to try and hack those services. But yeah, okay, but we probably need need their permission for that first. I mean, obviously we can steal uh, or try to steal someone's password if that's allowed and try to reuse it. I mean, for the, the service, there will be no, no difference. But directly attacking that service, that of course uh, we cannot do because that that's, that's illegal. There's other examples where someone has uh, asked to target a specific person. And that is really uh, tricky as well because we cannot single out any specific single person or even a department of people if the uh, department is too small uh, and the amount of employees. Sometimes customers ask us, can you give us a complete list of every single person that clicked on the phishing link or that ran your your malware simulation or whatever it is? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We're there to address the process and to see, does this company need more controls, more security measures when it comes to processes, when it comes to training, when it comes to technology? But it's not our job to help the customer kick out or chastise certain people within the company, because for us, it's all the same. It's just everyone needs to follow the same process. Uh, There are no people that are more equal than others. Yeah. I remember I came face to face with one incident where um, an international operator wanted us to assess a very specific piece of hardware that only had like two or three users in the world at that time you know, governmental military organizations and things like that. And this company certainly wasn't one of them. So like, even the premise was like, why do you even have this piece of equipment? And, you know, are you just looking for a list of vulnerabilities or like, what's the situation here? And we actually turned that down as well. Yeah. Or it could be examples where the customer is asking to retrieve information, which um, might give the company itself problems with GDPR, for example. Right. Because just having the information And having it stored outside of something um, that uh, didn't receive any security measures or data classification by that customer, that could already be a problem right there. So it's really important that as part of red teaming that you discuss these things first as far as when we steal or receive confidential information, where do we store it? Do we even need to store it? If we need to see if we can get into your customer database, I don't want your customer database. But give me a few numbers and I'll tell you, you know, maybe a few characteristics of the data that proves that I had access to it. And from that moment, uh, we try to figure out a way to see if we can test the uh, response of your team when I'm trying to download a piece of, you know, information or or, or data that looks like it, but isn't necessarily the real database. So Mm -hmm. that way you test the controls and we, uh, we stay out of that gray zone. That makes sense to me. Um, one edge case that popped up recently, I saw it on, on Twitter, was uh, there was discussions about companies asking uh, for security tests on the home network of their employees because everybody's working from home. Is that something you'd be willing to undertake? Um, no. And I don't really know where these um, where these requests come from because, I mean, someone's home network is not much different from sitting in a hotel room or in an airport or any kind of uh, public venue in that yeah. you need to consider the network compromised. Yeah. And that should be okay because that is why companies harden laptops or any kind of devices that you take on the road, be it at home, be it wherever you are, and to make sure that you always have hard disk encryption, that you're using VPN, 
that you know what services you're talking to, that you're aware that these things are out there. And your home network is, is no different. I mean, everyone's mm. home network at home is not going to receive the same level of attention or has the same amount of people uh, working for it, trying to secure it. So by definition, you should consider it breached, so to speak. So I don't know where these requests come from because, you know, it kind of goes beyond the normal working environment. Yeah, I don't know either because, you know, if you can use the the laptop anywhere outside the company, then surely any place outside the company is equal. True. If you work for a governmental defense agency or whatnot, that could be the case that that is required. Uh, but now, you know, that's maybe the 1% of all the use cases there. But it could also be that, you know, an organization doesn't really know what they should be testing. And that uh, comes back to if you know that a certain organization is not ready for a red team, then someone working in cybersecurity also needs to have the necessary uh, ethical background to be able to first propose other initiatives to get that maturity up before doing the actual red team test, knowing very well that the customer doesn't have anything really to be able to detect or respond to the attack. Yeah. So consider these networks compromised, consider them no different than a hotel room or, or an airport. And mm. uh, from that point on, you can go out and do your threat modeling and risk modeling. That's fair. All right. Um, let's say you accept an assignment and now you're performing the services. Uh, and as a red teamer, you're uh, sending out phishing emails, installing malware on people's computers, faking your way into buildings and in invading sensitive areas, uh, you know, to help the company find out the vulnerabilities and improve their security. But where's the line? What activities are going too far? First and foremost, you need to follow the law of where you are, local laws, uh, federal laws, international laws. So that, that comes first. That's also like one of the you know biggest differences between actual attackers and us is that we are bound by law. Correct. But it doesn't mean that our um, attacks uh, need to be less effective. Mm -hmm. And that if there's certain things that we cannot do, for example, take identity theft, you can uh, propose certain mitigation strategies to customers to say, look, this is what you can do to detect this. Uh, this is how you can respond to it. And this is to some degree how you can prevent it but it doesn't mean you actually have to perform those. My favorite example is always, you don't need to trigger the fire alarm to try um, fire safety. This is the same thing. So you wanna always make sure that you um, are within the full bounds of the law. And with that, of course, comes certain do's and don'ts. You are not allowed to intrude on the personal living space of someone. Even if that was legal in certain countries, I mean, we, we would still not do it because it's intrusive and it's a little bit creepy even. And if someone is able to sit into your backyard trying to do all kinds of, you know, IT attacks or cyber attacks or whatnot, they're going to get in. So it's not really up to us uh, to say we're going to uh, intrude on the personal living space. There are other people that do that, like, you know, private investigators in certain countries have that right or that is uh, within the law, but that we, we cannot. Same thing when it comes to anything that has to do with the airwaves. We have to be extremely careful what we can do there especially when it comes to uh, receiving, but also when, when sending. And also when it comes to uh, any kind of communication towards the person, be it letter, be it email, because there are some very strict laws on that too. But outside of those laws, whatever you come across, you can use in red teaming for sure. But we do need to draw a line somewhere in that if it deals with very personal details of someone, we're probably not going to use it. Will it work? Sure. But we also need to consider that it needs to go into the report afterwards. And we mm. will have to disclose it to some extent to, to the rest of the company. So that's why we, we look at things. We're very good at forgetting certain things. Uh, and we pick better examples that will better prove the point and will not get that person or, or the organization into trouble. But how about your like personal ethics? Like, let's say you're a uh, smooth talking uh, a receptionist, for example. Like, how do you feel about lying to that person? Well. A criminal is going to do the same thing, and a criminal is going to do it for the purpose of stealing information, transferring funds, whatever it is that they they uh, they got into the back of their head that they want to do. So I'm there to address the process. So we usually get um, what security awareness training companies are receiving or what employees are, are, are supposed to follow, and we try to find examples where the person should know better. And that does mean, you know, a few white lies, try to get past the reception using whatever excuse 
where it says in their books that uh, they shouldn't allow certain cases or they should be able to handle certain requests for information in, in, in certain ways. And then we try to find the actual gray spots, the gray zones in between those situations where there's no real playbook and where the uh, procedure or the process turns into guidelines where the, um, the employee uh, themselves need to start thinking for themselves. And that's usually where things uh, can go a little bit wrong, but that's also what a, what a criminal will do. So that's what we're trying to replay. But again, we do it in good taste because there's different ways of getting past, you know, if you take your example of getting past the reception, you could, I'm going to take a really extreme example now, you could pretend that, you know, you're part of some kind of medical service and say that part of your family or, or friends or, or spouse is in a serious health condition. That's certainly mm -hmm. going to get the attention of uh, of that person. But we don't want to do it in a way that it will hurt or harm other people short term or long term. We're, we're allowed to cause a little bit of discomfort. Maybe we can embarrass people a little bit trying to evoke some kind of emotion, but we cannot indoctrinate or, or harm uh, people while while doing this. Yeah. OK, so it's different to say I have a parcel to deliver than to say your father is dead. For example, or, you know, click on this email because the CEO just died and it's about your shares in the company. Or, you know, <laughs> uh, we've seen this done, but we, we don't do that because, again, there's different ways, more effective and more tasteful ways of, uh, of trying that out. Okay. Now, you work for an international company. I know you've done red teaming in different countries. Uh, how does, like, geography and cultural differences play into the ideas of what's ethical in red teaming and what's not? There's a definite difference between uh, different countries, different cultures. If you were to type in your password on your laptop in front of me, then I have the the kind of the, the natural courtesy to look away, to show you that, look, I'm not interested in your password. That, that, that's something that belongs to you. But there are countries where that is not really a thing. And if you ask people to maybe look away while you're typing your password, they will be a little bit stumped and ask you, but why? We're all employees of the same company. Um, so huh. it is different in certain countries uh, that I've seen. Also, when it comes to countries where um, respect and your hierarchical position in the company is extremely important, where consequently losing face is uh, extremely important to avoid. And there it becomes really difficult sometimes to have certain scenarios tested. For example, when we discovered a, a weakness in a certain IT system, and we verbally reported this to, to, uh, to our customer, they asked us not to report it because it would not bring any honor or respect to the family of the programmer that was responsible for that system. <laughs> and, wow. and there you are. So you need to find ways of, of, of bringing this information to the customer because that's ultimately what, what they're, they're paying you for. Uh, but there's different ways of reporting it. So you want to make super sure interesting. It happens. It happens. Um, we've also had cases, for example, where um, we were asked to look for maybe, you know, if we could get in through what's called password spraying or password stuffing is where you mm. guess a bunch of passwords or you, you reuse passwords that have leaked from different services uh, that someone has used. And we try this technique out as part of our tests. And we see, for example, that we get in using very, very basic passwords. We do not put the passwords in the report because mm. we do not want the, 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 the report to become a weapon in that once you have possession of the report, now you can access the services of these people. Right. And of course, we tell people to change their passwords uh, after the security test as part of you know, some, some, some general update or whatnot. But within that window of, of, of time, it might become an ethical situation where there is a risk that someone is able to access those services and no one should have the sole responsibility for that. So that's that's ways that we kind of uh, steer away from these kinds of uh, sticky situations. Yeah. I mean, I also love like um, password dumps when, when you see like actual people's passwords and, and there was like a, a recent big dump where there was a member of parliament and their password was something like, you know, I love Rebecca. And uh, Wikipedia tells me that this person is married to a person named Lisa. So, you know, that's going to be an awkward conversation at home. That's an awkward conversation. And maybe the guy can talk his way out of it. But we've seen situations where we have to target a certain department yeah. at a certain company. And that 
certain department is responsible for accessing a, a bunch of services for uh, customers, which are really important for whatever reason, which means we only have to target that particular department and those people have only those particular mobile phones or laptops. And then we look at the signals that come out of these laptops and phones. And then by accident, as a red teamer sitting at your desk in the middle of the night, you see signals coming out of someone's phone or laptop and see that, you know, their, their, their Wi-Fi has previously connected to two of the biggest swinger clubs in the city. And that is where you have to keep your mouth shut and make sure that yeah. it doesn't end up in the report or any kind of uh, data trace because it's not really relevant to the project that you're, you're doing. So Absolutely. you learn how to forget fast. Yeah, okay. What about the techno technological side? What's legal on the internet or on public airwaves? Like differences in different countries, whether it's okay or not to perform a port scan, for example, or, you know, listening on conversations. That is extremely sensitive, of course, because that is bound to whatever country you are in when it comes to listening in on, on conversations. And again, certain things fall within the law. Other things fall out of the law. Growing up during the 80s, I've had it several times where I pick up the, you know, then Chinese made portable telephone, one of the first models, and you hear the neighbor talking because they had, they're on the same frequency. There's no real law that says, you know, you shouldn't listen in onto people, but, you know, you just picked up the phone and you, and you heard it. So, yeah, have you broken the law? Yeah, maybe. But if you just keep your mouth shut, then um, you stay within that ethical, uh, ethical realm. So in the same way, when we perform our, our red teaming work, we have to be very uh, careful to follow the law. And if it goes beyond the law, that we know what we're doing when it comes to uh, listening in to conversations, either um, digital or, or, or in real life, standing next to someone. If you overhear a conversation where the company is going to be acquired, there's going to be massive layoffs, there's going to be a new flagship product or service being launched. These are the times that, you know, you hear these things, but you forget them, you keep your mouth shut. You don't go home and tell your spouse or, or whatever, because these things could have ramifications when people are in the know, people have shares, there's some kind of a monetary gain or loss to be had. Uh, so you have to be really careful there. Um, also, you mentioned port scanning. Anything that has to do with the public domain is a very sensitive area because there's no real laws when it comes to public information. So if I were to take every single YouTube movie and run it through a machine learning library to be able to identify the person that's in the movie or try to correlate whether or not that person has been in multiple movies, either by their face, their body, their voice. What do you do with that information? Is it legal to store? Is it ethical to keep? Can it be stolen? Can it be abused? Of course. So sometimes you don't want to have the data. You want to stay out of the situations. But there are people that... Uh, try to um, bend these kinds of rules. No, that's interesting because like you're talking about like information that's publicly out there, like you're doing almost like OSINT, like open sources intelligence on it. Like it's information that's out there. You're just using it for ways that maybe it wasn't intended. So when does that probing for something on the digital assets uh, cross over into the questionable or unethical? That re that's really up for discussion. Um, we had it with port scanning, where if you're doing a port scan of the entire internet, which people are doing for research and other purposes, is that for for good? Is that for bad? And also, you have to look at the at the zeitgeist. I mean, back in the day, port scanning the internet was was something that you know no one really knew about, uh, but it was still frowned upon. But then again, you could argue, you know, it, it's it's just a packet, uh, it's a mm. piece of information. But at the same time, we both know what kind of systems are, are on the internet, either intentionally or, or by accident. So that could have consequences. So just you know, blindly uh, doing a drive-by scan of the entire internet has consequences. So if you want to do that for research purposes, for example, you need to know exactly what you're looking for and you need to be able to reduce the risk that you will hit something which will have certain consequences that you know you might never know about. Because you might say, I don't really care that something goes down. Maybe there's a, a hospital bed online somewhere or some kind of factory that loses power. They shouldn't have put it on the internet, someone says. And you know, then it should be fine. But that's kind of you know sweet talking yourself into um sticking your head in the in the sand and not considering the consequences of your actions. Yeah.
Okay, so what do you do if you can't look away? Like, let's say there's an, a clear audit trail that you came into contact with some information, some highly sensitive data that you, you know, w- was within your scope, but that still, you know, you, you shouldn't have. Like, what do you do in that case? Well, you discuss it with, with the customer, of course, uh, and you try to see if they can handle it in a certain way where the customer might have had the situation before. So you want to see what they've done before. If not, you want to take it to the legal department of that company to seek legal advice uh, as far as what the ramifications could be or how to uh, take certain decisions at that point in time. Uh, I know that sounds very high level, but you know, just making sure that you know what is legal and what is not, uh, and if the NDA, the non-disclosure agreement that you've signed, actually covers it. Uh, sometimes uh, addendums need to be made to NDAs. I've uh, I've experienced that personally, where we've come across a, a situation where, by accident, I, I gained certain information I wasn't supposed to have, um, but then you sign an extra document to say, look, uh, I will now uh, officially forget this information. I, I promise uh, hereby that I've not stored it anywhere. I've not told anyone about it, uh, and that's usually the um, the end of it. But let's say you download, like, for example, something that you thought was going to be one thing, but turns out it's another. And now you're, you know, digitally in possession of this information. Like, do you have to somehow prove to the customer that you haven't made any coffee, copies of it or have uh, disposed of it? How, how does that work? Well, it, it's hard to mandate and, and, and enforce, of course. And, and there you are really bound to your, um, your ethical background and saying, look, I, I deleted it. This is the um, the receipt, so to speak, of the software that I used to, uh, to to delete it or to wipe it, rather, so to make sure that it's really forensically uh, unretrievable. And that should be the end of it. So you need to take all the precautions uh, that you can to make sure that the data is not recoverable and that there's no other ways that someone could have uh, retrieved the information. I get that. All right. We already touched a little bit about reporting, but let's talk about that a little bit more. And so you've finished your testing, you're creating your report. Um, are there ethical concerns to consider when, you know, com- on how to communicate weaknesses and vulnerabilities to the companies, for example? Yeah. So as, as mentioned, um, the, it's very important not to single out a certain person, not to single out a certain department if it's only a few people. So you never want to have full names in the reports, also not the first you know, letters or whatnot with which someone can still uh, figure out the, the names. Now, having said that, when you do compromise someone's workstation, uh, again, agreed with the customer, uh, those people need to have their passwords changed, of course. So the customer does need to know which people need to have their passwords uh, changed, uh, but that doesn't need to be you know, in the report. Uh, that can be a, a meeting or a communication you do with the customer um, where you help them select which ones need to have their passwords changed or you do it as part of a, a general password change process, for example, and, and that way you don't single anyone out. Um, so no full passwords, no full names, not anything in the report that can personally identify someone within the uh, the company. The end result of the assessment, of course, in the report, be it good or bad, the consultant that's performing the the uh, the test has the responsibility to consider the entire picture uh, when it comes to security weaknesses and vulnerabilities. By using or not using a, a service or a, an IT asset that might already give away information on its own. So you want to be really conscious about that. Um, and also, you I mean, don't forget uh, consultants, uh, whoever they are, who are guests to companies. Uh, everyone always steals with their eyes and their ears. Uh, even though it's not being reported formally in a document, you will still bring that information somewhere else. So whatever you learn uh, about uh, a company that is not technically part of the report, uh, you should try to um, forget uh, as fast as possible. But as said, if there are certain things that might be a problem, we are ethically bound to put those in the report. If we see a crime being committed, fraud, embezzlement, these kinds of things, we need to bring that to the attention of the company and they need to take legal actions. Because if not, you have the, the responsibility of dealing with it and we want to stay out of that. So it really comes down to what is the right thing combined with what is legal, because you know, as, as uh, that topic is, uh, has been going on for quite a while, just because it's uh, illegal doesn't make it right. Um, so we want to make sure that we do everything in our, in our power not to uh, bring ourselves, but also 
uh, not to bring the customer into any kind of uh, trouble and to make sure that we have their interests in mind. Let's talk about advice to companies buying these sort of services. Um, what would you recommend companies do to make sure that their own ethical concerns are addressed and that the red teamers they hire are going to behave ethically and within the scope of their local laws and cultural norms? This is where experience comes in. So mm-hmm. you want to role play a little bit and to go through the motions of what the different stages will be of the project from gaining information to abusing that information to uh, gaining some kind of foothold running around or doing lateral movement on their network, finding the information you're supposed to find. Uh, and of course, as a side effect, coming across information that you will learn about that you don't technically need. And then trying to you know, exfiltrate that information or to go through some kind of process that will uh, result in the same effect on the, uh, the radar scope uh, of your customer. And you try to evaluate, you do a little bit of a risk assessment as far as what situations or what information you will come across, what is fair game and what is not. And there we have a pretty detailed list of things that we need to know when going through the motions and when doing these kinds of red team tests. For example, a lot of, uh, of the financial industry uh, has red team tests performed And that also means dealing with people trying to walk into an office, trying to walk into a branch office. Banks are very interested if, you know, if someone can just walk in or, and to make sure that their, their security investments actually make sense. One of our questions is always going to be the people that we're going to come across, have they ever been in situations where they've suffered some kind of trauma or some kind of incident or hold up, anything like that? Because if so, we want to select a different office or maybe see if we can have uh, different people in the office at a certain time. Because we at least are not interested in having those people plunge back into trauma or to relive those experiences. Because for us, it doesn't really make any difference, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but we do care about who we're performing these 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 services on. And that's okay. really where good taste comes in. No, I get what you're saying. Like, you know, if if I was talking to a, a potential provider of a service and they raised that kind of concerns on their own, then, you know, that would certainly tell me as a customer that these guys have thought about this a little bit, that, you know, sounds like they're on solid ground. Well, it's it's not just, you know, trying to uh, get into companies like Wild Cowboys no, no. and trying to do things. It's actually, you're dealing with pr- real people here who, who are trying to support their families by working at an organization and, and trying no, to, that's to, a valid to do point. work. Yeah, yeah. But what about, um, for example, uh, when you're talking about like bug bounty participants or or hackathons or, you know, when you're not in direct contact with each and every uh, participant, but these people are potentially going to be in a position where they have access to confidential information? Well, this is a, a kind of the, the big neon uh, question mark uh, on the wall in that, yes, you will uh, write out a bug bounty again when a whole set of... Uh, circumstances uh, and um, processes are already present because a bug bounty program can never replace um, your current uh, security initiatives, vulnerability management and, and things like that. But if that person, you know, with all best of intentions and having clicked through all your terms and conditions does end up seeing your production database, your customers, your intellectual property or any other kind of, you know, information, you need to be very sure and inform you know, whoever uh, is the stakeholder in that situation that they will have access to that and that there is a risk that that information will get abused, misused, uh, or that something will happen that the company is not, not expecting. And this brings us to a, a bigger point in that in order to protect data, you as an end user, either as a consumer or a corporate you know, uh, a customer of ours ordering a red team or any kind of security assessment, in order to protect data, you want to either protect it yourself through you know, software, hardware, a way of working a process, but it will always involve exposing that data to software, hardware, you know, the, the process of, you know, someone making this hardware or software or, you know, different people as part of a as part of a red team. So you want to be able to um, put your data somewhere for, for safekeeping, but in order to be able to test the safekeeping, you need to see if someone can get in. And if they can get in, they're going to be able to see your data. So it's, it's an inherent risk that you need to uh, calculate um, when going for bug bounty programs, red teaming, 
and then knowing what the rules of engagement are when someone does uh, burst through your defenses and sees information that normally wouldn't be uh, meant for their eyes and ears. Yeah. Well, thanks for helping us wade through the muddy waters of ethics, Tom. Pleasure to be here. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSound. Thanks for listening.